after 30 years, has Rwanda recovered from the horrors of genocide? To some, it seemed miraculous the country found any stability in the wake of almost a million killed in 100 days. A Tutsi rebel group led by Paul Kagame was able to transition Rwanda to one of Africa's more stable economies, but his detractors say the cost of that success is far too high. I'm Andrea Sankey, and today's newsmaker is Rwanda. Its sheer brutality and speed shocked the world. In 1994, Hutu militants in Rwanda massacred more than 800,000 Tutsis and moderate Hutus, victims of which are still being uncovered today. The country has since arguably made a miraculous recovery, maintaining stability with a youthful population enjoying often impressive economic growth. But other Rwandans will tell you something quite sinister lies beneath the surface. With a strong-armed president, they suspect of committing serious war crimes, not just in Rwanda, but abroad as well. Here's a look. Three decades after the genocide in Rwanda and the bodies of victims are still being unearthed across the country. The remains of more than 100,000 genocide victims have been discovered across Rwanda in the past five years alone. It's unfortunate that after 30 years, we still found bodies under a construction. We feel bad, and we keep thinking about what happened. Imagine a baby born in 1994 is now 30 years old. If you tell them that those are your grandparents and relatives, we found them in the pit latrine, it's really bad. For 100 days in 1994, Rwanda, a small nation in Central Africa, witnessed one of the most devastating genocides of the 20th century. Nearly one million people were killed as a result of brutal violence, mostly against minority Tutsis. Not only Tutsis, but moderate Hutus and others who opposed the slaughter were also killed. The genocide prompted an armed Tutsi force, the Rwandan Patriotic Front, led by Paul Kagame, to launch a military campaign which overthrew the government and brought the killing to an end. Kagame has been in power ever since. And despite the enormous divisions and suffering, Rwanda has been able to rebuild itself. In some cases, perpetrators and victims live side by side. For Rwanda, the source of our solidarity comes from our commitment to never allowing a repetition of the tragedy that was inflicted on us near 30 years ago. In the years after the genocide, more than 120,000 people were detained and accused of criminal responsibility for the atrocities. Those deemed to have been most responsible were dealt with by a UN-backed international tribunal and the national court system of Rwanda. The lesser cases were served by traditional dispute resolution forums, which allowed victims to tell their stories. And while President Kagame is seen as the architect of this reconciliation, his rule is not without controversy. Critics say the successes of Kagame's iron fist rule have come at the expense of human rights in the country. Rights groups have described the country as safe, but only if Rwandans keep their heads down, don't ask questions or challenge the government. Human Rights Watch says commentators, journalists, opposition activists and others speaking out on current affairs and criticizing public policies in Rwanda continue to face abusive prosecutions, enforced disappearances, and have at times died under unexplained circumstances. But Rwanda's economic progress is undeniable. There has been a substantial improvement in living conditions, and Kagame has advanced women's rights. Around 60% of its parliamentary seats are held by women. And yet Rwanda's governance still splits opinions, with some seeing reconciliation, stability, and a relatively prosperous economy while others paint a different picture. So how does Rwanda's government see its recovery after three decades? Well, joining me now to share his perspective from The Hague is Rwanda's ambassador to the Netherlands, Oliver Duhunjirege. Thank you so much for being with me. You know, as I mentioned at the top of the program, there were those who thought Rwanda just couldn't recover from such a profound atrocity and such deep division but you believe it has to a large extent. So tell us what you think 
got Rwanda to where it is now from where it was in, in 1994? Thank you very much for having me. Um, uh, we are commemorating the um, 30th anniversary of the genocide against the Tutsi. And it's true that in 94, uh, the country was completely destroyed. Uh, the economy infrastructures were in shambles. Uh, one Rwandan out of eight uh, was killed. So everything was a priority. But, but we decided uh, that uh, we will not just recover or uh, reconstruct the country, but uh, engage in a social economic transformation and achieve unity and reconciliation of the, the population. Because at that time, Rwanda was lost for many observers uh, because uh, we had um, a genocide that was committed mostly by neighbors, by, um, by uh, family members. So it was within the people. So uh, the country was lost, but we decided that we will uh, stick to our unity and reconciliation. And we have achieved uh, success, uh, I could say. The, yeah, I, I mean, you believe then that there is now trust between Rwandans, Hutus, Tutsis, and uh, that divide has, has mostly been bridged. But what do you say to those who believe that there's something lingering just too close to the surface that could actually re-destabilize the country, including, you talked about, you know, neighbors, many of them actually did run into the country next door and there is a horrific war underway still in the DRC that some say Rwanda is quite complicit in. We, we have, um, uh, over the past 30 years, achieved really uh, a, a significant milestone in unity of Rwandans because the situation in 94, uh, after three decades of uh, genocide ideology, was really uh, critical where Rwandans were apart. Uh, and then this is what, what um, uh, facilitated the genocide. As I said, it went one Rwandan out of eight were killed by neighbors and family members, right. by civilians, ordinary people. But now we still... We don't have that kind of uh, ideology in Rwanda. But the problem is that uh, those who committed the genocide in 1994 have uh, uh, sought, sought refuge in a neighboring DRC where they continued the ideology and the killing. This is what we see now in Eastern DRC where the, there is a hate speech similar to that was uh, going on in Rwanda before the genocide. We had the Tutsi, Congolese Tutsi, because there are Congolese Tutsi also, are persecuted on a daily basis. So this is a concern for us. This is uh, happening in Eastern DRC. But uh, we, of course, uh, calling on international community to make sure that uh, history does not repeat itself. Mm. But I mean, what do you make of the many accusations that are out there that Rwanda is complicit in those atrocities being committed now in the DRC by backing militarily the M23? This is, of course, the, the narrative of the Congolese uh, government uh, for the past, I would say, uh, 28 years, because we know the issue in Congo, it's an issue of governance uh, for uh, many decades, uh, since the 60s. And uh, now have those uh, refugees and those uh, militias who committed genocide in Rwanda were received in Congo, were not disarmed, who continue to... Uh, uh, to spread their ideology uh, uh, and uh, to persecute the local communities. Now, the FDLR, uh, which uh, is the descendant of those who committed genocide in Rwanda, are, on, are uh, embedded into within the Congolese army. This is the situation that we have in Rwanda. And this uh, M23 issue is an internal Congolese issue because those are Congolese communities fighting okay. for their rights. Okay. Uh, quickly, I mean, your, your president now has been in power then for the 30 years uh, since the genocide uh, ended. Do you think he is the right person to continue bringing the country forward and continue healing the divisions that are still there? Because as you are very aware, there are those who complain. He has been in power for too long and that it is a one-party rule, basically, in Rwanda now. Yes, but we need to understand that uh, uh, the, the, partic the particular situation of Rwanda, because uh, in 1994, uh, President Kagame was uh, the head of the RPF, which stopped the genocide, while the international community uh, was looking on. 
so uh, this uh, many Rwandans, almost all Rwandans are, are, uh, are grateful for that. And then not only did he do that, uh, but also he put in place what I was talking about, unity of reconciliation uh, of uh, Rwandans, uh, which was not expected by many observers, but also uh, to uh, the, this economic uh, turnaround that we see, the social economic transformation, the good governance, fighting corruption, inclusion of women, uh, protecting the environment, all of this is uh, to his credit. But of course, Rwandans also as a people, we, are, we have contributed because we are, we are resilient people and then we made uh, sacrifices. So okay. it's a particular situation that we cannot compare to other countries. Understood. Ambassador Duhunjere Rehi, unfortunately, that is all the time we have. I'd really like to thank you so much for being with us on this edition of the Newsmakers. Let's broaden out the discussion now on the legacy of Rwanda's genocide. And joining me from Nashville is genocide survivor Claude Gatebuke. He is also the co-author of Survivors Uncensored and the executive director of the African Great Lakes Action Network. From London is Phil Clark, professor of international politics at SOAS University. And from Denver is Pastor Christine Coleman, author of SOS Rwanda's 30-Year Apocalypse. Thanks all so much for being with me, Claude. I'll start with you. As you know, uh, there has been praise for Rwanda, as we heard from the ambassador uh, speaking earlier, but you seem to think that recovery has too much really of an artificial polish on it and that the legacy and even underlying causes of the genocide are still present in Rwanda. Why so? That's exactly 100%. Um, the, not only are the underlying um, causes of the genocide still present, we have uh, one of the major perpetrators in the genocide, um, Paul Kagame and the RPF, who actually started the genocide by shooting down the plane that was carrying the Rwandan president, an assassination that killed two presidents, and actually started the genocide that I survived and actually had to dig my own grave during that genocide. Uh, and also, uh, when it comes to uh, moving forward, there has not been justice, especially justice for all victims. Rwandans are unable to actually tell their stories in their fullness because so many of them lost their loved ones before, during, and after to this day uh, uh, to the RPF. Uh, they lost their loved ones to the RPF, which is in power. And today, when you speak about it, you are actually imprisoned. Uh, and uh, many genocide survivors are, are imprisoned today either for refusing to comply with government policy of, uh, of uh, sticking with the official narrative but the government of Rwanda or, um, or, or telling their stories in their full entirety. So uh, Rwanda still okay. has a long, long way to go. Huh. Uh, Christine, I'm wondering what you make of, of Claude's analysis there and how you think Rwanda actually remembers this anniversary every April. April. I mean, is the overall atmosphere, do you think now, one of peace and reconciliation? Uh, so I agree with my colleague, uh, Claude Gatebuke. Uh, in Rwanda, the genocide has been politicized, and uh, we are so far away from reconciliation uh, because some people, especially like Hutus, they are not allowed to remember the loved ones who died in the genocide. Uh, the unity that they preach is only on television. It's only on the lips. Uh, there cannot be unity uh, when uh, some people are not allowed to speak up. Uh, there cannot be unity if justice is not applied. And I agree with him. Uh, Kagame has his hand in the genocide. So today in Rwanda, you have uh, criminals who are in power. And what do you think they are going to do? Do you think uh, they are going to bring forth justice? Or do you think they are going to try everything they can to protect themselves? Okay. So that's the situation we have now in Rwanda. Thank you. Interesting. I mean, uh, Phil Clark, I'd like to get your take on that question. I mean, 
it's so interesting to hear the government praise so much progress while we hear victims of the actual genocide say that the entirely opposite scenario is really what's true. I mean, are there criminals in power from what you've seen, or are there still people who are justifiably angry over what happened and maybe looking for the causes and, and someone to blame? But look, I think what we're hearing from Claude and Christine here is a, a monumental distortion of history. This this idea that the RPF is responsible for the genocide, un, unfortunately, is the kind of propaganda that comes out of the, the Hutu diaspora uh, in particular. But, but I think what's also important about what Claude and Christine is saying here is that it's a picture of uh, daily life in Rwanda today that would bear no resemblance to what most everyday Rwandans uh, see uh, in their own lives. Um, and, and I think it's a symptom, perhaps, of Claude and Christine being out of the country for a very long time. I've been traveling to the country every year for 20 years. Uh, this is a country that has made remarkable strides uh, since the genocide in terms of reconciliation in particular. You've got hundreds of thousands of convicted genocide perpetrators living back on the hills, side by side with genocide survivors, getting on with their lives, going back to their farms. Uh, that, I think, is testament to the progress that the country has made and the energy that has been put into the, uh, the the reconciliation project. So unfortunately, I think what we're hearing from Claude and Christine here is a Hutu narrative uh, that does not want to take responsibility for the Hutu perpetration of the genocide in 1994. And, and th this kind of propaganda, in fact, is incredibly dangerous. Claude, let me ask you, do you think possibly there's an underappreciation for the progress that the country has made? I mean, perhaps if this government in power now hadn't taken power, Rwanda would look more like the DRC, for example, looks today, still in a state of war and in total instability. Um, Rwanda is still in a state of war because uh, many of the streets are littered with soldiers. Rwandans live under constant surveillance by the government of Rwanda. And uh, the, when, when you talk about it being like the DRC, the DRC is the way it is because Rwanda in Uganda have invaded the Congo and actually committed a genocide in the Congo. Uh, this has been documented in the UN mapping report. Uh, there are witnesses. Our book itself, Survivors Uncensored, has many, many testimonies. There's over 100 testimonies, many of them talking about those atrocities. So the Congo is the way it is because Rwanda has and Uganda have invaded uh, the Congo now. Uh, there is a reason why me and Christine cannot go back to Rwanda that uh, Phil Clark is uh, ignoring, which is because we speak our mind, because I have refused to, 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 to censor parts of my story to fit the narrative of the RPF, I cannot go back because if I went, if I went back, I would, I would be harmed for simply telling my story as it was. So that is actually Rwanda's government propaganda. And there are many paid non-Rwandans who do travel to Rwanda many, a lot to, uh, and who are able to come and actually spread this type of uh, propaganda. So Rwanda is not, uh, is still in, in a state of war. Uh, Rwandans are disappearing every day, uh, especially young ones taken to the DRC to go and uh, fight this war that Rwanda has caused in the DRC, the invasion into the DRC. Um, Rwandans live in a constant state of uh, fear. Research, research has shown okay. more than 500,000 Rwandans have disappeared uh, of my generation at the hands of the government, of the Rwandan government. And you've seen the case of Paul Rusesabagina, who was kidnapped from outside of Rwanda. Inside of Rwanda, this is a common, a common thing that happens all the time. So the healing is very, very far away. Okay, let, let me come back to Christine then. I can see you agreeing with, with so much of what Claude says, but I, I want to ask you the same question. Are you sure you've entirely considered the alternatives? I'm not defending the government in its current state. I'm just defending the, if I, I won't even call it a defense. I'm just saying that the state Rwanda is in now is relatively stable, relatively safe, compared to A, its neighbor, and B, what it was 30 years ago. Do you at all acknowledge that perhaps there maybe is a different narrative coming from the people that have been in the diaspora for, for decades now? I would just say 100% that Rwanda is not safer. What Rwanda has right now uh, is that they build buildings, uh, they build something to show to the foreigners 
when they go to Rwanda, you just will see white washed tombs. But if you go to the rural area, if you go to the prison, uh, there are many people who are being put in a jail. Uh, they are innocent. I would just say Rwanda is now safer because before the coming of RPF, there was zero kidnappings. There was zero people being killed here and there. But today, the facts are there. We have many journalists who are being put in a jail. Even right now, as we talk, uh, there is a journalist, uh, Joseph uh, Kofi, who just disappeared last week. Every other week, there are famous people, there are journalists, there are politicians who are disappearing uh, while before this issue was non-existent. Okay. Ever since the RPF put their feet on the Rwanda soil, the peace has left. But today I would say, yes, you're going to see beautiful buildings, you're going to see clean streets, but underneath, people are suffering and the blood is being shed okay. everywhere. Uh, Phil, I mean, I keep seeing you shaking your head. I, I, I don't understand how these narratives can be this far apart. This, I think, is a, a symptom of the genocide. We, we end up with these very polarized uh, realities uh, about what is happening uh, inside Rwanda. But again, I would come back to this point that what we're hearing from Claude and Christine is unfortunately a classic Hutu diaspora narrative uh, propagated firstly by people who do not want to take responsibility for the Hutu perpetration of the genocide against the Tutsi and who are simply detached from realities in the ground. I think one of the things, unfortunately, that, that Claude and Christine and, and others in their community missed out on because of being out of the country uh, was going through the Gachacha community court process between 2002 and 2012. For, for 10 years, the entire Rwandan society went through a systematic process of dialogue and justice that brought perpetrators, Hutu, uh, Tutsi survivors together to talk about the causes of the conflict. And it was an incredibly reconciliatory and healing process for those who went through it. Now, unfortunately, the Rwandan diaspora did not participate in Gachacha and missed out on many of the virtues of that very important justice and reconciliation process. The, the situation inside Rwanda today bears no resemblance at all to, to what you're hearing, hearing from, from Claude and Christine here, unfortunately. Interesting. But, uh, Paul, Interesting. Uh, I have to ask you, Phil, going forward, at this point, it has been, I put this to the ambassador as well, obviously he still supports, you know, the party that he is appointed through, but this has been 30 years now of, of Paul Kagame as president. And you know there are a list of complaints about the lack of political freedom now in the country. Both of our other panelists agree that is a severe case and an abuse, really, of what was supposed to be a democracy. Is it healthy for Rwanda to continue, though, at this point, going forward with the same one-party rule? Or do you see it uh, corrupting and distorting now, at this point, the legacy of what happened? I, I, I think that's the big challenge for the RPF now, Andrea, is to start to open up the political space. I, I think for 30 years, there has been this very tight control, limits on freedom of expression, freedom of association. Some of that has been necessary because there are still genocidal forces and genocidal ideology present inside Rwanda and in the diaspora today. So a certain amount of control of that space has been required. But the key for the RPF, and I think this is the challenge for Kagame now, is what does the next phase look like? The huge foundations for reconciliation have been laid. One of the challenges now is to open the space, to release some of the pressure that I think many everyday Rwandans inside the country do feel. Um, the RPF, I think, is aware of this challenge. They, they recognise that there is discontent in the countryside, particularly about what people can and can't say. Mm -hmm. um, there's a, a necessity now, I think, to release the pressure, open up uh, the political and the social space, and, and the RPF uh, ha has that tough task ahead and over the next 10 years. if they don't open years. up that space, what happens? There will be discontent over that, but, but these predictions of 
uh, tensions beneath the surface that could manifest in future violence, I don't think are there. And I, I, I think that there is some discontent there, but, but it's not on the scale that Claude and Christine are suggesting. Because what they're leaving out of their narrative is the enormous amount of work that has been done at the community level through Gachacha, through socioeconomic programs to deal with the legacies of, of, of the conflict. So this is not a country that anytime soon is going to go back to mass violence. But there is a need there, I think, to, to open up our political liberty more than we've seen in the last 30 years. Claude, has your mind changed at all hearing hearing this argument? No, because we're hearing from a paid agent, basically by the government of Rwanda. Uh, this is um, this is someone that is always in defense of the government of Rwanda. We have right now black and white, black people who experienced the genocide. We have our relatives that live in the country. We know what is going on in the country, but we have somebody from the outside lecturing us, trying to tell us what is actually happening to our own people. And that is the, the definition of privilege and entitlement. When you think that, if, that something is not a problem because it does not affect you or because you benefit from it. So what we have in Rwanda, I have not, it has not changed my mind because the reality is the reality. Hundreds of thousands of people are still imprisoned after decades and decades of, of, um, of okay. false imprisonment. Okay, um, I'll Phil, give an Phil I, I know you disagree, uh, and I know you don't. You don't. You say you don't work also, for the. You're, I'm you're being, a professor at the. Yeah. And also, I'm being libeled here. Uh, I mean, I'm being accused of being a paid agent, which is not true. And and Claude, unfortunately, has has to revert to these kind of personal attacks because no, the substance no, no, of no, no, his no, argument. No. Is, is baseless and so okay and so it's, unfortunately it's I, I i would like to allow this kind of dialogue to continue but unfortunately we're completely out of time uh, for this edition of the newsmakers i'd really like to thank all three of my panelists so much for being with us i'm sorry christine i couldn't get you a final word but uh thanks to our viewers of course for joining us as well remember you can follow us on x and do be sure to subscribe to our youtube channel i'm andrea sankey we'll see you next time